Welcome to Conversations That Matter. This episode is brought to you by Autumn Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Autumn Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started the show. Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. Of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a cast, be it video or pod, I suggest you reach out to Oh Boy. They can help you produce it, and they can help you build your audience. And we also need your support. I ask you to please pledge $1 per show at patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce the show. Now to this week's episode. As a trading nation, Canada's livelihood depends on the seamless import and export of many different products. At the very center of the port of Vancouver is a busy mix of traffic on the water. Cruise ships, grain ships, automobile transport ships, and container ships to name but a few of the more than 12,000 ships that call into port every year. Vancouver is one of the most complex ports in the world. The reasons are many. The port is federally controlled. It's within the province of British Columbia, and there are 16 different cities or municipalities and several Coast Salish First Nations lands that are home to shipping facilities. In fact, there are so many elements within the Greater Vancouver region that intersect with the cities that play host to the port, it's hard to know where city boundaries end and the port's jurisdiction begins. There is a vast array of roads and rail lines that are all on port land, and while you may have some access to certain stretches of the shoreline, it's up to the port to decide if you can get close to the water. The port owns the land, it controls its use, and it is responsible for many of the transportation decisions that are made throughout the region. For example, the expansion of the Portman Bridge and Highway, as you may recall, was to enhance the gateway image of Vancouver. Well, it worked. Port Metro Vancouver is a success. It is Canada's largest port, and it handles an enormous amount of cargo. In fact, It is the most diversified port in North America. In 2018, more than 146 million tons of product worth more than $2 billion passed through the port. In total, there are 27 major cargo terminals that are served by three Class 1 railroads and related services. And let's not forget the Canada Place Cruise Terminal, which is home port to the Vancouver, Alaska cruise industry. The economic impact of the port is substantial. More than 115,000 people are directly or indirectly reliant on the port for their paycheck, which totals more than $7 billion annually in wages. The Port Authority manages over 16,000 hectares of water, more than 1,000 hectares of land, and close to 350 kilometers of shoreline. Now, not wanting to sound like an advertisement for Port Metro, but I I encourage you to go to its website where it lists its responsibilities, which include, but are not limited to, safety and security, permitting, environmental reviews, planning, transportation operations, infrastructure development, customer service, communication, collaboration, and real estate management, the latter of which brings me to our conversation today. The Port of Vancouver is so big and it works with enormous companies that it's kind of in view, but it's also out of view. It's just over there and you don't get to really see in. That is until today, because our guest, the president and CEO of Global Container Terminals, said you as a taxpayer deserve to know how the administrators of the port do some of their business. He claims they are about to make a land use and terminal decision that in his words is a conflict of interest. Doran Grossman says the port wants to bump his company off the bidding list to expand Delta Port to double its current capacity. We invited Doran Grossman to join us for a conversation that matters about where to draw the line when an authority with too much power 
determines it can do as it pleases. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Give us a little bit of a history about your facility in Delta, uh, how it's grown, and where it is that you're uh, proposing to go. Yeah, so GCT Container Terminals is a Vancouver headquartered business. Mm -hmm. We're the largest marine employer in Canada. Um, we have been around for 112 years, wow. so since the Empire stevedoring days, and uh, so has grown container terminals in British Columbia, so have we grown to support that. Not so th this was a company that was, uh, that was born in British Columbia right here in Vancouver. We are a Canadian headquartered company. Our owners are primarily Canadian right here in British Columbia. Uh, the uh, British Columbia Investment Management Group and over in Ontario, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan hmm. are the majority equity owners in our business. And over the many years, we've invested a tremendous amount of capital to grow container capacity here in advance of demand. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done it in an environmentally friendly way in compliance with the, uh, uh, the law and also in compliance with the practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, doing that. Uh, we are faced with an interesting situation today in that uh, in about 10 years from now, there will be the need for additional container capacity. Beyond what you already have. Beyond what, not only what we have, but what additional capacity will be brought online between Prince Rupert and Vancouver, between Centum, Vantum, and Delta Port here mm -hmm. in Vancouver and Prince Rupert up in Prince Rupert. So container demand for the next 10 years is either well taken care of capacity that's in the ground right now mm -hmm. or about to be brought on in the next 10 years. So that's been good forward planning, being in, uh, in place with the appropriate resources when you need them. Exactly. So and now good stewardship of, uh, of the industry. Right, yeah. right. And we've been doing that in collaboration with the Port Authority, as has our competitor, Dubai Ports World. Now, if we roll forward to the end of the 2020s, there is going to be the need for incremental capacity. And we are at a crossroads today in terms of how is the best capacity to be brought in line to deal with that demand? Who is best positioned to bring it on? Mm -hmm. Where is it best to bring it on? And with whose money is it best to bring that capacity on? Delta Port Berth 4 at uh, GCT Delta Port is a capacity expansion of 2 million 20 foot equivalent container units. That is almost a doubling of our capacity over there. By adding in the, the one new facility, just by almost double what you have. Just by adding wow. an additional berth and an expansion to the yard that's mm -hmm. there. We just completed a $300 million rail expansion that's been online uh, as of September 2019. But this uh, particular project that would come on stream in 2028 would bring that 2 million, two million um, 20 foot equivalent units of capacity on stream. So very wow. much in line with uh, the demand that will come forth. It will be phased capacity. So our shipping customers mm -hmm. in Asia and other parts of the world are very excited about it. We serve the top 12 sh ocean shipping companies in the world today. They're all our customers, wow. uh, all 12 of them. And so they are very excited about this additional capacity that we're planning on bringing on. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick break. I have a lot break. of patience. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is brought to you by Audlin Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Audlin Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started this show. Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. And of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a show like this one, I suggest you reach out to Oh Boy. They can help you produce it and they can help you build your audience. And we also need your support. I ask you to please pledge $1 per show by going to conversationsthatmatter.tv slash donate because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce this show. Now, back to the show.
How important is this expansion in maintaining our place as a gateway to the east of Canada and into the central and eastern parts of the United States? Because that is something that we've built ourselves as being capable of uh, delivering on. Yes, it's critically important because um, if you are a beneficial cargo owner who has contents in a container that's coming over on a ship, you have the opportunity, if you're going to the central parts of the United States, what we call the Ohio Valley, to put your goods on a ship that's going into Los Angeles, Long Beach, Oakland, California, near San Francisco, mm -hmm. Seattle, Tacoma, Vancouver, or Prince Rupert. So we here in Vancouver mm -hmm. are competing in that West Coast market. And um, we're very critical as that <laughs> demand grows. We've got to make sure that we've got that incremental capacity to deal with that demand. These are long-term decisions, and, and so they uh, affect uh, shipping routes, contracts, and a wide variety of things. So, okay, everything that you say makes sense. You've done, you've done Terminal 1, 2, and 3. You've done it, as I understand, properly with all the appropriate uh, engagements. What's happened? How come you're running into a roadblock now? Well, we find ourselves in a very unusual position in that uh, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority are our landlord. That mm -hmm. per se is not a problem at all. Right. But the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority are um, putting forward a capacity expansion in Roberts Bank called Roberts Bank Terminal 2. And in so doing, they are not only our landlord, but they become our competitor, but they're also our regulator to regulate the project that we've put forward called Delta Port Berth 4. So being the landlord alone, no problem. Being the regulator alone, if we didn't have a project, no problem. But we've put forward a project which is competing with the project that they have. They're our regulator. And in that regard, they are not an impartial regulator anymore. They have inherent bias and a conflict of interest. And we emerged to that point of challenge back in February this year, after discussing with them for many years our project, which they knew very clearly about, and they knew that we were going to submit what's called a preliminary project inquiry. And we submitted that back in February of 2019. And at that point, they summarily rejected our project. Did they give you reasons why? They did. Which uh, were? There were three reasons. And interestingly enough, on each of these three reasons, uh, there's grave concern. The first reason is that they have a, their own project. So we don't really have the right to have our project. They've, they've got theirs, and they think that's a better project. So that is the inherent bias. So that then there's there. no competitive process at all, then, if that's already that decision has already been made. Precisely. All we're looking for over here is a fair, transparent, equal footing process to have our project adjudicated. In fact, it's their statutory responsibility to adjudicate our project, and they've summarily rejected it. Mm -hmm. So that was the first reason that they gave. The second reason that they gave is they cited a Department of Fisheries letter that is um, 16 years old. Now, a couple of things have changed in the mm -hmm. past 16 years. Uh, many regulations have come in that have superseded those old regulations. New regulations are about to come in as it relates to uh, environmental um, adjudication of projects. So a letter of that duration is aged. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the project... So th this was pointing out uh, an area where maybe you didn't uh, come up to a standard going back a decade and a half Correct, ago. correct. Okay. <laughs> but secondly, in that letter, they were referring to a project that is not the project that we have put forward. It was a project at the time that the Port Authority was adjudicating in Roberts Bank, but it is not the current project that we put forward in 2019 of uh, GCT Delta Port Berth 4. Oh, so it doesn't unrelated. apply, so okay. it's unrelated. Yeah. So that was the second reason that they cited. And then the final reason that they cited was they have a policy. It's not a part of their statutory requirements. In fact, they are opining beyond their jurisdiction that they think that there should be three terminal operators here in Vancouver. And that if additional capacity is going to come on at the end of the 2020s, that they'd like a additional terminal operator besides GCT Global Container Terminals and DP World to be the operators they'd like somebody else to come on. Now, they attempted to get a terminal operator 
twice before. The first time, the process failed. The second time, they had shortlisted five foreign companies. And at this point, none of those are really standing interested in being the terminal operator here. And here you have a Canadian company investing yeah. Canadian money with a 112-year track record mm -hmm. uh, of delivering that is ready to develop the uh, capacity there. And we are not just competing for cargo coming into Vancouver. We, the market that we are competing in stretches from Prince Rupert in British Columbia all the way down to Los Angeles and Long Beach. So that third reason that they documented in the letter that they sent us, we don't feel is prudent. It's caused you enough frustration to come on this show and say, I'm going to tell you what, uh, and I, I think that one of the reasons that maybe you're here is we give you the opportunity to, to lay this argument out, but it must cause you tremendous uh, frustration to be at this point. Well, you know, we have been tenants of the Port Authority for many years. And we've had a strong relationship with them. We've collaborated with them. We've worked on multiple projects together and done wonderful things together. That's not to say that there hasn't been a bump in the road in the relationship, but we've overcome that bump. But unfortunately, we found ourselves in a position after having our projects summarily rejected with no alternative but to turn to the legal process, which is not something that we would naturally choose to do. But if we did not choose to do that, we would have given up our right to contest their rejection of our project. So what are you doing then? When you say you're taking that legal venue or, or avenue, well, what's your first step right now? So we filed what's called a judicial review. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is filed, the two judicial reviews, both filed in the federal court in Ottawa. And the first one, very simply put, is uh, contesting the bias and conflict of interest that the Port Authority uh, has displayed in summarily rejecting our project whilst being our regulator on the basis of the three reasons that I just cited um, for you. In essence, you're calling them a, a conflict of interest. Right. Yeah. And this is not, this is well known, this conflict of interest, uh, both in Ottawa as well as in Victoria. And we've had conversations with the ministers, min numerous ministers in Ottawa about this. And Minister Garneau has, in fact, initiated the port's modernization review mm -hmm. uh, some time last year. Quite honestly, he kicked it off back in GCT Delta Port, which we were thrilled about. And we're hoping... <laughs> On your property. <laughs> yeah, we're hoping that the outcome of that port's modernization review will um, remove this uh, conflict uh, whereby a port authority can compete with a tenant for new capacity expansion. But you don't dare wait. Just in case it doesn't, you have to you have to take legal action. So within 30 days of having our project uh, dismissed or denied to be a project to step to the next phase of the process, we had to take this legal action. Otherwise, we would have lost that right. Mm hmm. Wow. And so at this point, where do we find ourselves as it starts to eat away in the planning process? Because these projects do not come together quickly, as you pointed out. It takes yes. years and years and years of planning. The longer this drags itself out, how does it then start to impact our ability to meet the need when it comes online in a decade and, and more from now? So the need for additional capacity is a long time away. Mm -hmm. And the importance of that additional capacity is critical to the local communities in Delta Port, in the greater metro area of Vancouver, and British Columbia and Canada. And so, in fact, there is no rush to select a project tomorrow morning mm -hmm. or next month. Um, we've been working on our project to get to this phase of the preliminary project inquiry submission for four or five years. Okay? And we lay out quite clearly in our project submission that our project would take 10 years to bring that additional capacity online, six years mm -hmm. for environmental considerations and other regulatory uh, aspects and four years to do the construction. That gives oh. us enough time to have the capacity on stream by when the demand would be looking for the capacity. And we also believe that the judicial review uh, within the court system will take place very shortly. We don't know an exact date for that yet. Mm -hmm. And it will provide a resolution that we will certainly abide by. You know, one of the audiences for this show, of course, are people who are decision makers, the regulators and so on, they're going to hear about it. But for the average person who is not directly involved in your business, but they live here, 
Why do we need to care about this? Like, why is this fundamentally important that we pay attention to what's happening here? Because what's the signal that it sends? I think we have to pay attention to this with great earnestness. This project will bring on about 10,000 person hours of jobs when Delta Port Berth 4 is constructed. It will bring somewhere between 200 and 300 million dollars, Canadian dollars, of tax revenue. Of tax revenue? Of tax revenue. <laughs> it's going to um, increase the GDP because of that incremental capacity by somewhere between a billion Canadian and a billion and a half. This so is a significant contributor. These are big numbers, yeah. but for the individual person, this is very meaningful. And so we, one has to pay attention to this. Now, our project um, has a lot of positive attributes compared to the alternative. The first very positive attribute to the uh, folks who live in this area and who depend on the area is that our project is uh, entirely compliant with the environmental aspects that we will need to remediate. We demonstrated when we built Delta Port Berth 3, which required remediation, that the reme not only was the remediation done, but a number of years later, after the remediation was checked to see if it had complied with the improvements in the environmental standard, it had complied. So our project would do the exact same thing. It's in an area environmentally that's a lot less sensitive than the alternative project is. So that is an important aspect to the folks. Um, the First Nation people, who we're very actively engaged with, not only the Tawasan First Nation that we've been involved with for many years, but also Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh and others, mm -hmm. um, are keenly interested in this project and are engaging very actively with us. And this is taking place in an area in which is their territorial homeland. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very respectful and inclusive of them in the, uh, in the process. Most certainly. Beyond that, the Canadian taxpayer, whether you're here in Vancouver or British Columbia, but in Canada, they don't want to be funding these large infrastructure projects. So our project is funded by private capital. Okay? The alternative project is funded by public capital. So the taxpayer's money to the tune of $2 billion. Our project costs half of that $2 billion for the same amount of capacity brought on stream at the same time. So I, as an individual taxpayer living anywhere in Delta or Greater Vancouver or British Columbia or Canada, really care a lot about this. Yeah, well, so do I, because I think that it's fundamentally important uh, uh, to the way in which we continue to move forward and grow as, uh, as a country economically. If we don't pay attention to these things and do them right, we're going to hamper our own ability to grow and take a place on the world stage that like, we already know we hit above our weight. We have to stay... Uh, we have to stay focused and, and continue to do things right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm glad that you came here and came in here and we're, we're willing to have this conversation with us because these are the kinds of things that I think that we need to be paying attention to. Thank you so much for coming in and doing Thank this. Thank you so much, Thank Stuart. you. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.